thing about Buzz Aldrin that there was this very cryptic tweet that came out during his stay down there. And he said, we have seen the faces of evil and we're all in danger. Right. And this is right before he had his heart attack. And I can tell you logistically to do a medical evacuation from the interior of Antarctica is very difficult yeah. and very expensive. So something must have majorly gone wrong with Buzz. And that was December of 2017, I believe. Right. And in the work that I have done about the missing National Science Foundation scientists, and that goes to the work I've done with the naval flight engineer who was there in a C-130 crew that was assigned to take in 12 or 15 scientists with a whole C-130 full of gear. And they went to Marie Birdland, which on that map, if McMurdo is down here on the west side, uh, Marie Birdland is here. Wait, wait, you're saying on this East map, where, where yeah. would it be? Here is where the missing, the missing National Science well, Foundation is map. right. Yeah. If you what? guys can see here, and here's McMurdo, and we're talking about East Antarctica over here, but probably Beardmore Glacier, as being where some kind of an alien intelligence has had some kind of presence, structures, craft, everything for at least, let's say, 34 million years. But, you know, before you get to that, why don't we finish the whole German Nazi thing and talk about the black sun and how that relates to what you, your whistleblowers discovered, and then we can get to the missing scientists, right? I mean, well, it, it, to underscore the fact that when the C-130 crew had dropped them off, they disappeared. And then when they went to try to find them, there was nothing at the National Science Foundation camp at all. Nothing they were moving. gone, two, they a were dozen totally scientists. Gone. And when they did show up, they had been missing for a couple of weeks. And uh, Brian S. and the C-130 flight crew were then sent back. And they were expecting that they would see this group of scientists out to meet their plane, doing this, yelling, something. And he, he said they were lined up like birds on a wire. They were all kind of next to each other, and most of them had their heads down looking at their feet when the C-130 was pulling up. And that somebody had to go from the flight crew over to the scientists and direct them to get onto the plane and they talked about how not one single scientist said one word. Most of them walked with their looking down at the ground. Brian said when they got them loaded up, he said to his uh, flight chief, what in the world? Where have they been? And the flight chief said, I don't know, we can't get a word out of them. And during the flight, Brian went and sat down next to one of the scientists, and he said he leaned over and touched the scientist's knee, and the man never looked up. And he said, it was as if we were dealing with 12 or 15 people who had suffered post-traumatic shock syndrome, that they were unnaturally frozen in their position and no speaking, and that they all looked afraid. And the question is, if Buzz Aldrin had a heart attack, that's a leap of speculation because of what he saw and was exposed to in one of these underground facilities that my whistleblower Spartan One has described, then was that hole, the big hole in the ice near Pole, where those scientists went, and did they meet face to face with the non-humans that have been variously described as hairless humanoids to something so strange that one of the seals that I have talked to that is not in the video said that as they walked for a mile or two miles into these very strange created architectures. They reached a point where something started coming through the walls out into the air. At first it would go in and out of visibility and then they realized that their minds were being manipulated and then when they could see it clearly and it was coming in and out like a television signal in the air, it appeared with uh, scales 
like an armadillo, the surface of an armadillo. And he said, when you are face to face with something like that and you are trained in military to kill, but you're dealing with something you've never seen and it can go in and out of visibility and you know that your mind is being taken over by something that you are fighting. He said that happened in one of those corridors and that was 2012. So those scientists were severely traumatized and yes. they never come forward as a whistleblower, none of them. Well, one of the things that I think uh, is important to emphasize is that uh, NASA was set up under German control, that uh, in the 1950s deals were made with the Germans in Antarctica where there would be technology sharing and the Germans in Antarctica would give the US administration uh, the Eisenhower administration technical and scientific assistance in reverse engineering some of the extraterrestrial craft and in return uh, the Eisenhower administration would funnel a lot of uh, resources, a lot of manpower and funding to the German space program in Antarctica and, and the cover for all of this was the Apollo program and the way they did it was they set Germans up who had been brought over under Operation Paperclip to run the Marshall Space Flight Center which was actually in charge of the Apollo program and the Marshall Space Flight Center was, uh, was run by Germans who were former Nazi uh, officers, uh, Werner von Braun and his deputy and the whole team of German paperclip scientists were put down there at the Marshall Flight Center to run the Apollo program. And also you actually had at the Kennedy Space Center, you had Kurt de Bus, who was another Nazi official uh, who was put in charge of the launching facility for the Apollo program right throughout the 1960s and 70s and all of the funding for the Apollo program, 22 billion a year, was actually a smokescreen for putting man on the moon because what was really happening was that they were funneling a lot of money that the CIA had, had getting through all their illicit processes uh, through NASA down to the German program in Antarctica to help the Germans to get not to the moon, well they got there, but also to Mars and beyond. So in my book, uh, the, the, that's uh, the latest book that's out there, the US Air Force Secret Space Program and, and uh, Space Force, it basically says, my argument is that while the Apollo program got Germans, sorry, while, while the Apollo program got Americans to the moon, it got the Germans to Mars and Alpha Centauri. Brad, yeah, and, thank and you. And just to follow up with what Michael s said, that the, the Apollo program was just a cover for the real technology that was in the secret space program. Much of that funneled out of Germany just before the war to these bases, uh, Point 11 New Berlin base, which Admiral Dolent said, we have created an impregnable fortress for the Fuhrer in 1943 and that is presumed to be this new Berlin base in New Schwabenland. Also when I was in South America, I was discovering that there are still these massive tracts of land in Chile and Argentina where also some of these scientists and laboratories could have gone. Mm. And what's so interesting in all this and what also uh, Spartan One has talked about, that in this big craft, is the black sun. Right, talk about that, Linda, because it gets even weirder, right? Yeah, it's I mean, a lot weirder. Yeah, and one of the most fascinating things in doing research into the history of the black sun, you can get it back into Mesopotamia. It is associated in Sanskrit with something that would sound like they are describing the soul, the animus of the body container. Can you describe but, what it looks like? Yeah. Um, ring, 12 arms coming out, at the end of each 12, two 90 degree angles. There's the first one, there's the second one, and each of the 12 arms has the two 90 degree angles. And so you have this image like that. And they found this in these underground and structures. The, and these uh, were carved by Spartan One's testimony, they were carved on the inside of the installation, and he had to, he had believed that what he would be encountering were 23 
foot high doors, 18 feet thick. All he had to do was put his index finger on the outside and touch and <laughs> the entire 18 by 23 massive bath salt would move. He would go through, it would close, he would turn around and there would be the 23 foot by, I think it was 17 feet wide, black basalt with, up here was the black sun and down here was a star map. And the star map was being studied by an astronomer that was also, they had scientists there in addition to the language people. And the astronomer told Spartan One that one of the doors they had, be, had put, taken the pattern, put it into a computer program for analysis. And it had produced information that there were three focal points in this one particular star map below a black sun and that the three focal points when they went to Hubble, they, it became a Hubble project to do a reality check on this. And Hubble, when, when they took the photographs of Hubble and they did the overlays and all of these things and found these three focal points, they concluded one was at the center of the Milky Way galaxy and the other two were in a geometric relationship to what they said were two universes outside of this universe. This is very hard to wrap our heads around, but just hang in there for a second because as I continued to investigate the histories of the black sun and all of the related subjects to it, a man who was a physicist in England a month and a half ago or two sent me an email with an attachment that looked like the black sun. Not 12 arms, there were 18, but it was the same two 90 degree angles at the end. And he said, consider the possibility that this new physics symbol, arms with two 90 degree angles, and here is what it stands for in modern 2019 physics. If you accelerate an electric charge to the speed of light, it instantaneously turns into a sphere. And that pattern represents that in physics today. What if the black sun has always been an alien intelligence's representation of the network of portals throughout the Milky Way galaxy and beyond, and that this is how they move through the cosmos. Mm. It's the occult symbolism of the black sun being replicated in this age-old ship. Maybe the Nazis found it first, and then that became one of their symbols of their occultism. You mean the swat sticker? Was a, no, was well, a, even before that. I mean, this, this is even a deeper. That, this is like the inside symbol where the swastika was like the outside yeah. symbol. Uh -huh. The black, the black, you try to look. This is fascinating because I spent maybe a, an accumulation of five days going everywhere on the web, in old encyclopedias, in books, in everything, trying to find any photograph from World War II that would show the SS and Hitler with the black sun. If it exists and you can find it, please let me know. I could not find anything that had them all in one scene. It was as if Himmler, who I think Himmler probably made the decisions about the black sun as a symbol that would represent the SS. It is a German name that's Stoffersteffel, or I have a hard time pronouncing it, but it's the SS. And they were designed to be a intimidating and brutal security force for Hitler, and it was Himmler who chose the black sun to represent them. Now here is a classic example of something that had a history that went back to Mesopotamia. And it was not associated with brutal security forces in Mesopotamia. 
but they reached back from Germany to get that for some reason that I personally, this is just a personal opinion from all of the material I have been uh, swamped in for the last several months. I think they were dealing with full blood ETs. I'm just going to say, I think that Maria Orsic and those blondes were associated with an extraterrestrial presence that was interfacing directly with some of the German power structure, and that I think they had portal abilities to go back and forth to different places, and that when Maria Orsic, who was head of the Vril Society, disappeared during the war, I bet she ended up back on a planet in Aldebaran. I can't prove any of this. But what I think and speculate is that the black sun in Mesopotamia was there because extraterrestrials, full-blood extraterrestrials, were the Anunnaki and the Sumerians. And that means that in the 20th century, at the time, as a DIA guy told me, quote unquote, World War II was an extraterrestrial war between competing, fighting extraterrestrial civilizations fought through human bodies, close quote. And if that's true, and if a lot of the wars going back through to Samaria, and I think Anunnaki was real, I do not think it's mythological, that there have been warring extraterrestrials throughout this solar system and that the black sun was probably a technology representation that was used by one or more. It was there, the current ETs interfacing with Hitler during World War II knew all about that. They were influencing the development of the Vril and they had some relationship to the Black Sun, and they inspired or told Himmler to use it. And that is how all of that came about, allegedly in human terms in World War II. I think the biggest influencers were alien intelligences. Mm. Well, go ahead. Yeah, um, thank you. Man, I'm glad you're sitting down. Wait till you hear this. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, I have this crazy memory, it's eidetic, and I remember things. And when you're coming out of a heart condition, you ramble, you got medications, and they're messing you up. But Buzz said something, it was a phrase, and he was just staring out the window when he said it, and I, I remembered it, but it didn't make any sense. Until you just said all this, and I went, holy smoke. You know Buzz fought in World War II, right? You know, he was, he was in the conflict. And it, this may not mean anything at all or might really be significant, but he said, um, they're back and we're going to do it all over again. They're back and they're, back they're, and back they're, and they're going to do it all over again. And it's what he said, it's just like, it's how he said it. It's just like somebody's been beat to death, you know. And can, can you believe it? We're going to do it all over again. And that relates to what I was saying that one of the possibilities that the whistleblowers raised is that one of the alien intelligences that may not be very nice <laughs> returned in 2017 and that when Buzz Aldrin went there, this is what they were worried about is that something had come back and it was dangerous and they had uh, Kerry and Aldrin and the Greek guy there for reasons that are not clear, but the whistleblower says that is exactly the time that the unmentionable returned. Michael, uh, I yes. just wanted to bring, bring us back to this idea that uh, the US Navy knew all along that the Germans were working with this reptilian extraterrestrial group called the Draconians and that uh, Bill Tompkins said that these Navy spies would come into the briefing room at Naval Air Station San Diego and would be embarrassed to be saying that, well, you know, we saw these beings, these reptilian consultants, giving all of this information to the Germans or to the Nazi SS in terms of how to build these craft, giving them instructions to go to Antarctica. And, and that's what happened. And the Navy knew about this all the time. And so that...